Hello, I'm Dr. Simon Hull from the University of Cape Town's Division of Geomatics, and welcome to the 15th video in the series, An Introduction to Land Administration. This video is the second part of two videos concerned with the fit-for-purpose approach to land administration. In the previous video, I gave a concise summary of what the fit-for-purpose approach entails, looking at the seven elements, three frameworks, and 12 guiding principles upon which it is based. So if you missed that video, it might be worthwhile to head on over to that one before watching this one. In this video, we'll, we will be looking at the benefits and limitations of the fit-for-purpose approach to land administration. And secondly, we will discuss whether South Africa would benefit from adopting the approach. According to the fit-for-purpose land administration guiding principles, Current land administration solutions in developing countries are built on legacy, often colonial approaches that are largely inappropriate and are simply not feasible or affordable to roll out at a national level. They propose that the fit for purpose approach to land administration will have the benefits of being able to affordably and quickly deliver secure tenure for all while allowing for incremental improvements to the land administration system over time. The table summarizes what some of these benefits could look like. We go from a limited range of tenure types reported to support for the entire continuum of land rights, rather than exclusively focusing on individual land titling. We go from uh, specifications for high accuracy surveys being mandated in regulations to regulations that are flexible to accommodate a wide range of different methods to measure and record spatial unit boundaries including identifying visible boundaries on images. We go from uh, licenses restricting operators in the land sector, for example, having only professional land surveyors being allowed to uh, make property-based surveys. Uh, in the fit for purpose approach, a range of stakeholders can be allowed to operate in the land sector, including locally trained land officers acting as trusted intermediaries. We go from predominantly judicial processes to the majority of land transactions being administrative, uh, re releasing the pressure on the courts. Uh, before the fit for purpose approach, uh, specifically in some customary or traditional contexts, there is gender inequality. Uh, and in, in using a fit for purpose approach, then we adopt a legal framework that is associated with tenure types uses associated tenure types that are gender sensitive. Simple things like making sure that there is a husband and wife on the land record or certificate, uh, or that it's not a head of household, that it's a, a family that is identified. We can go from uh, fragmented land institutions, limiting the integrated management of land, which is a particular problem in South Africa at the moment, to land administration institutions, securing land tenure rights, determining valuation and taxation of land, and managing the use of land and land development in an integrated, coordinated, harmonized, uh, integrated land administration system. We go from a lack of information to support accountability and transparency in the delivery of land administration services to having open, accessible, transparent, uh, land information uh, that all stakeholders can access within the constraints of privacy of courts. We go from a situation where there is insufficient capacity to sustain land administration solutions to a focus on generating capacity in public, private and civil society sectors uh, through capacity development programs and creating possibly a new genre of locally trained land officers uh, which would be needed in the uh, in the third uh, in the third before and after uh, we, we discussed the licenses restricting operators in the land sector uh, we would look at uh, lastly the private sector being excluded from participation in the land sector in a before scenario but after using the or using the fit for purpose approach we look at public private partnerships uh, in order to enhance capacity and in order to bring in the private sector's know-how and finances to be leveraged in the land sector. 
The fit for purpose approach requires adoption of significant changes to the way things have always been done. In the guiding principles, the following challenges facing adoption of a fit for purpose approach are noted. The first one is behavioral and cultural change. Land professionals need to accept lower standards of precision and accuracy in boundary demarcation and a move away from the state of the art technological solutions to more practical, purpose led solutions. Uh, land professionals tend to think of this uh, domain as their own uh, and protect it. And uh, there needs to be a shift towards a more accommodating, embracing uh, approach to the land administration domain. The legal framework also needs to be revised to accommodate the fit for purpose approach, as mentioned previously. Secondly, capacity development and change management are, are challenges. Training is required at all levels, from academic institutions to government departments and civil society organizations such as LandNet. And this set of videos is one of such example. Community members need training on what land information needs to be collected and how. Organizational managers and community leaders need training on information management. And the third challenge is judging success. And I'm going to pull up a quote here. Success across developing countries will emerge when politicians understand the benefits of the fit for purpose approach and commit to the adoption of the nationwide fit for purpose approach in their countries. Further success will occur when developing countries have successfully formulated and implemented country specific strategies for fit for purpose land administration. And that comes from the fit for purpose guiding principle. In a guest editorial for a prominent journal, Professor Michael Barry expressed concerns about the fit for purpose approach. He recognizes that there may be many useful aspects of the guidelines, but notes that certain principles are overly prescriptive in a way that could limit their usefulness. In particular, he singles out the principles of visible general boundaries, the use of aerial or satellite imagery, and the flexible tenure and ICT approaches. The problems with these principles are that they are too prescriptive. Ironically, this goes against the ethos of the fit for purpose approach, which is to tailor solutions to fit the intended purpose. In other words, flexibility is favored over prescription. It is perfectly conceivable that in some situations, plot boundaries may not be visible from the air. How then is the community supposed to sketch the boundary on an aerial photo? Similarly, in some rural contexts, boundaries are not fixed in time, and plots may grow or shrink seasonally or in response to some other stimulus. If the boundary is sketched on an aerial photo, this fixes it in space and time. Any changes to the boundaries will need to be processed through the land administration system, creating a bureaucratic burden that cannot always be satisfied. Basically, plot boundaries sketched onto aerial photos are not always fit for purpose. The fit for purpose approach suggests that if we implement a set of strategies based on certain principles, then we can expect a favorable outcome. Barry cautions that this might not always be true. Any intervention changes the system, rendering the intervention obsolete unless new conditions can be created for its continued success. For example, he says, if we issue tenure certificates in a local political unit for the first time, the certificates change a range of power relations, social relations, and social norms in the community that is supposed to benefit. So the conditions for the success of the intervention have changed, meaning that the intervention might not succeed the second time around, unless new conditions can be created. Change is also a slow process, especially where cultural norms and traditions are being challenged. Barry highlights that it can take a generation, 20 years or more, of community-based support before people will adapt their practices and adopt a new land administration system approach. To sum up on the benefits and challenges, the Fit for Purpose approach suggests a set of guiding principles. The concern is that land administration land administrators might see these as a set of must-haves. This defeats the object. The 12 principles and 7 elements described in the previous video are generally good, sensible ideas, 
to assist land administrators to achieve successful, sustainable, and significant land administration. But another caution is that it takes time. We must not expect too much too quickly. And so we turn our attention to the fit for purpose approach and whether or not it would South Africa would benefit from adopting this approach. The short answer is yes. The longer answer is it depends. A different approach is certainly necessary for securing the land tenure of the wider population, especially in developing countries, as Mike Barry points out, and I quote, Since the Second World War, there have been a number of attempts at land titling in developing countries, and many failed because they were not suited to the local community and broader society needs, and the organizational structures, processes, and legislation were not in place to create systems of records that suited these needs. Generally, titling programs were based on overly simplistic assumptions and theory, where strategy based on a single variable, in other words, individual land titles, was supposed to generate major social and economic benefits. There was little consideration for the shifts in cultural values, social norms, and local level political structures required in the communities that were supposed to benefit from a sudden change to a system where documents suddenly usurped social processes in land tenure administration. On top of that, there was no understanding of the critical success factors for such an initiative to work, especially the sustained follow-up support at the household level that might be needed once a title is issued. It has been pointed out in both the high-level panel and advisory panel reports that the approach to land reform taken by the South African gov government has fallen into exactly the trap that Barry highlights here. This has contributed significantly to the poor performance of South Africa's land reform program. Hence, adopting a fit-for-purpose approach that is based on ensuring the significance for all relevant stakeholders of the outcomes and processes related to land reform and the building of a new inclusive land administration system, that will be a vast improvement. That is why we say yes, South Africa will benefit from adopting a fit-for-purpose approach. However, the challenges and cautions mentioned earlier must be taken into consideration, which is why we also say it depends. The fit-for-purpose principles are not a checklist of items that guarantee success for land administration. They are guidelines and should be treated as such. For example, the use of visible boundaries in aerial photos referred to earlier. This is a good idea, but it is not appropriate for all contexts. Some legitimate boundaries might not be visible in an aerial image. In such cases, an approach that fits the context should be used. It is also worth noting that the success of the approach has only been tested over relatively short timelines in a few countries. Its long-term sustainability has not yet been tested. And remember, it takes a generation before we see effective change. Thus, the fit-for-purpose approach, while definitely an improvement over the previous approach in South Africa, should not be taken as gospel. The principles are guidelines that should be tailored to our specific situation and requirements. Treating the principles as a checklist will almost certainly result in failure.